an interesting observation where he replaced the state with like one's own mind. So you can actually apply this. It's not just that a government does this or a society does this, but that people do this to ourselves as well. So you replace it with that, like a person who separates themselves in this way are going to have these same kinds of results. Okay. I'm going to ask, and it's going to break my heart, but I'm going to ask anyway. Who looked up Thucydides? It's unfortunate. It would be very helpful to know who Thucydides is. It's helpful, of course, to know he's a general, but he's a very particular general. He's a very particular general. Um, there's a reason that we still talk about him today. He wrote a book called The um, History of the Peloponnesian Wars. He was a general during the Peloponnesian War, which, um, any of you guys see the movie 300? Uh, for those of you who did, that's the Peloponnesian War. That was part of it. Um, there's a long war. And um, I guess the, the fastest way to explain it is that Athens lost the war. Now, Athens, when they lose the war, they look around, and they're kind of like, why did we lose this war? And there's two ways that you can go in life. You can blame yourself for your failures, or there's the more convenient way, which is to find someone to blame and say, it's that person's fault, or it's that group's fault, or so forth. So, so Thucydides was a general who was blamed for losing a battle. He didn't lose the battle. Um, so he was, it was the Battle of Amathlis. He was sent for by a general because the Spartans were, were attacking. Um, the Spartans knew about Thucydides. He had a great reputation as a general. And they knew that there was a messenger being sent to him to say, send your, uh, send your forces to, to, to support us in this fight. And so he knew that if, that if, that if Thucydides showed up with his army, the, the fight was over. So the Spartan general, um, oh, it's going to bug me. I can't remember his name. It's going to bug me. I can't remember his name right now. Um, he goes to the people of the city and says, essentially, listen, if you surrender right now, we'll let you keep your stuff. Just let us inside. And we promise not to kill you all. And so the people were like, okay. And the Greek general in, in, in charge at the time said, no, 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 don't do it. You know, we can fight. And the people were like, we don't want to get killed and have all our stuff taken. So they let them all in. And then uh, Thucydides got word that this battle was going to happen, asked for reinforcements. So he, he, got, his, he got on his, um, his horse, he grabbed his soldiers, they got there as fast as possible, within the, I mean, as fast as possible. But they got there too late because the Spartans had cut a deal with the city. So Thucydides was blamed for taking too long to get there. It took him like a day or two to get there, which was incredibly fast for how far away he was. So the people of Athens were like, well, why did we lose this whole long, you know, years, you know, decades long war? because of that one battle, because you weren't there fast enough. So they pointed at, at him because he was a well-known general, because this battle happened. It was one of the last battles of the war. And so he goes into exile, and he's sent off to this island, and while he's there, uh, while Thucydides is in exile, he writes his book, The History of the Peloponnesian War. And typically, up to that point, histories were written by people who were paid to do it. So if you were a king, if you were a prince, and if you were a queen, you wanted like the history of whatever written, you'd hire someone and say, here's a bunch of money, go write the history. Now, what kind of a history do you suppose you got with stuff like that? And there's no one saying that, that history is written by the winners. And that's absolutely true, especially ancient history is written by the winners. And so you get these, these glowing histories that speak very highly of the leadership of these countries. Um, but Thucydides didn't have any of that. He, uh, he of course, was, was, was bothered by it, so he, he sat down, he said, he, essentially, I'm going to write the history of this war. I'm not kissing anybody's butt when I do it. Um, but here's what actually happened. And so we have a, a, a pretty objective, relatively, I mean, compared to anything that came before it anyway, we have a, a relatively objective history of what happened in this war. So if any of you guys are, are interested in like military history, or even if you're just interested in ancient history, this is a, a book you really should read. It's not a hard book to read. Um, and it's kind of written it's, written, it's written pretty informally. It isn't just this happened, this happened, this happened. He offers analysis, which up until that point was almost unheard of. Essentially, here's what happened and here's why. And so when, he's, when he makes this comment in the book, he's talking about Athens. And he's essentially explaining, here's why Athens lost the war. Athens was degenerate. Uh, Athens had gotten too complacent. They got too soft. They, you know, they didn't think that they could be defeated. They were economically powerful. They were culturally powerful. But they didn't take into account that other people didn't think the way that they did and were willing to attack them and take what they have. You can tell me if that sounds familiar to, to anybody at all. 
And so um, from that, from the ashes of that, by the way, comes Socrates, who um, I had planned for next semester. Anyway, um, so when he, when he makes this comment, he's explaining how it is that a civilization can, can collapse and how a civilization can fall. And as I was mentioning earlier, this um, student from last period made the pretty wise observation that you can think of this as a person's own mind. And you can see how a person can fall and collapse. So um, let's try to explain this. Uh, when you have a, a, <clears throat> sorry, a scholar, what are some characteristics that we think of when we think of somebody being a scholar? What are they? Smart. And what does it mean to be smart? So maybe they're educated. Right. What else? What else is a scholar? That's it. Wise. He's wise. That's funny. These are the exact two things that last week came up with too. The very beginning. Smart and wise. And what does it mean to be wise? To know things. What's the difference between educated and wise then? Why have you been through it? So you, you know, right? So maybe there's something with wisdom that has to do with experience. Yeah. Yeah. Wisdom is essentially knowing what to do in certain circumstances. So, for example, um, to be educated, to be smart, is to know that tomatoes are a fruit. Tomatoes are a fruit. To be wise is to know not to put it into a fruit salad. So knowing stuff, and then knowing how to apply things. And a lot of times that comes with experience. And unfortunately, experience is oftentimes the name that we give our mistakes. So you go through life, you make a bunch of mistakes. Hopefully not many, hopefully you, you make fewer. Hopefully you're wise enough to learn from other people's mistakes, not from your own. I know there are people who say, I gotta make my own mistakes. That's too bad. You know, that's too bad. Because you're gonna, make, you're gonna have to do a lot of repairing in life. More than you have to anyway. You're already gonna have to do some. But it's, you know, it might be better to let other people make mistakes. I always think about the heroes who learned certain things for us. Like there are heroes out there who learned which berries you're not supposed to eat in nature. And of course, how did they learn? They ate them and then they died. And then we sat there and we said, let's not eat those berries. Yeah, somebody out there was the first person. We talked about how uh, Isaac Newton discovered gravity. I didn't discover gravity. We put together a mathematical formula for it. There was some poor asshole who was walking through the jungle one day and fell out of a tree or whatever, and he died, and someone was like, I think you die if you fall from a high place. <laughs> they discovered gravity that way. We learned that, um, that saber-toothed saber tigers should not be pet. As, as cute as they are, we should not pet them. We learned that this way. So hopefully we can, we can learn from other people's mistakes. What else would it be for someone to be a scholar, perhaps? Would it be easier if I asked you what it is to be a warrior? What is it for someone to be a warrior? Courage. 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 What else? Honor. Honor. Commitment. Commitment. <laughs> like I feel like commercial coming. <laughs> Honor. Honor. Courage. Commitment. The Marine Yes. The Marine <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I was listening to the video from last class and I made that comment about soccer. I sent it to my, I, I took a clip and I sent it to my friend and she was just laughing. She's like, man, they booed, they actually booed you. I go, right? <laughs> so courage, honor, commitment, uh, strength. Other things? Smart? Not really. No? He said they're not smart. Oh yeah, it's tactical spirit. Discipline. You said street smart. Uh, what does it mean to be street smart? Shoot people. Shoot people. How did you do that? I smart. <laughs> So maybe he says something about awareness. I'll leave it at that. We'll say street smart. But we know what we mean by this. Okay. So here becomes the problem. The state that does this. 
This seems pretty simple to be smart and wise, eventually. eventually. Um, but the problem with it is that if, you, if we separate it this way, shouldn't a scholar also be courageous? It, it, it takes courage to have ideas and to express them. There's no point in having deep ideas if you don't have the courage to express them. You can be the smartest person in the world, you can have something groundbreaking and revolutionary, but if you're afraid to share the idea, then you know, it, 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 it may as well have never even manifested itself in your mind. Um, if you're a thinker, shouldn't you also have honor? In other words, there's, there's a couple of ways of, um, I don't know if you know, so there are these, um, a group of philosophers called the, um, called the sophists, and essentially their job was to just be, they're lawyers. Think of it this way, do you ever think of, when you look at lawyers, do you think of people who have great honor? Why not? Uh, are they, what's that? They defend criminals. They what? They defend criminals. They defend criminals. Do they defend people who they know are guilty, do you think? Uh, yeah. So then why do they do it? For money. Oh, so they don't have honor, they're just after money. Are they smart? Yeah. Yeah, they're pretty smart, but they have no honor. A person who's smart and has no honor is a very dangerous person. Yeah. Not a good person. Would you, would you like to have a bunch of educated, dishonorable people running around your society? No, no. No. I mean, that's, it, again, it gets dangerous. It, it tears away at the fabric of, your, of our society. Um, I was just talking to someone last period, actually. This is kind of an aside, but it's in the same direction. It kind of tells you where our society is. By the way, that's a real question. What kind of money? Because there are, they're out there. You know they are. You know they'll line up and go, payday. School district will just settle. Free money. Cha-ching. They get 40% of the settlement. They're smart, but they're dishonorable. These people exist. And, they, and, and, they, and something like that, they really could cost lives. And, and, it's, and that's not just, I mean, that's just one scenario, of course. There's lots of scenarios in which you'll, you'll see this kind of thing play out in society, where, where it makes things worse because we have smart, dishonorable people. And so, um, think about, like, should a scholar have commitment? Should a scholar have strength? Should a scholar be disciplined? Street smart, we can get there. It should be. I mean, if you're, if you're somebody who's, who's so well-educated that you can't understand and connect with real people in real daily lives, another way of thinking of the street smart thing is to be practical. Be practical. Practical means that things work in real life. So, for example, um, I have a friend of mine, he's a, he's, a, he's a physics professor, and he's explained to me that using certain equations, he can prove that you can take a dandelion, you know those little dandelions, those little flowers, that if it's properly rooted, that you can actually prove that a dandelion can sustain a, a juvenile elephant who's wrapped its tail around it and is hanging off of a cliff. A dandelion can actually support the weight of a juvenile elephant. In theory, is that ever going to happen in real life, though? No. That's what practical, practical application is. A scholar can be so, well, you know, in theory, we can do blah, blah, blah. Who cares about theory? The, the warrior is more concerned about practicality. More concerned about practicality. So we can think of it this way. So should a scholar be practical? Well, if a scholar's ideas are ever going to be applied to the real world, well, then, yeah, they absolutely should be practical. I mean, we can think of lots of, well, we can think of specific political philosophies that sound great in theory, people oftentimes say, but every time we've ever employed them, they've led to just mass genocide. We can think of communism as an example. Very, very smart people, very, very, you know, nip nifty scholars can, um, will tell you about how, how, how great of an idea this is, and yet, every time we've applied it, hundreds of millions of bodies have piled up. And then we'll still have people with beards and glasses scratch and frown and say, we just haven't done it right yet. I don't know how many bodies have to pile up before we can look at it and say, maybe as scholarly as it is, it's just not practical. So, now we can ask the question in reverse. If a warrior is all of these things, should a warrior be smart and educated? Yeah. And should a warrior be wise? Yeah. yeah. And this becomes the problem, is that we create this delineation, either in our own minds, or you know, society does it. You know, governments will do it. We'll separate these two things out. But especially for those of you guys who are in, in RO, you know that you, you deal with like SEALs or Rangers or, or Search and Rescue, um, Recon. These are not stupid people. You can't have idiots go out there. 
In other words, what separates special, special operators from everybody else is that special operators have to have all of this going on. They have to be smart, they have to, you know, they have to be strong, they have to be wise, they also have to be courageous and disciplined, they have to know what works in real life. And when you get those kinds of people together, those are the ones who make it into special forces. It isn't just the person who can do the most push-ups, the person who can run the fastest. It's the person who's wise enough to know that you have to work in a team. A person who's smart enough that if you, gave them, if you give them a manual, they can sit there and read through the manual and become an expert in anything in a week. And then they can apply it. That if you give them, if you tell them, you're deploying to Afghanistan, here's a manual, here's, here's what you need to know. And to be able to sit there and read it, and learn about the people and the cultures, and, figure, and, and, and to understand, at least academically, what's going on. So that when you land and you get boots on the ground, you don't go over there, shake someone's hand the wrong way, and cause a tribal war that undoes you know, years of progress. You've got to be able to do all of this stuff here. And so I guess the question becomes, why is it that we don't seek to be all of these things? Especially if you're somebody and you have some ideas, and by the way, if you have ideas that are worth having, then you have ideas that are worth defending. And if you have ideas that are worth defending, then you damn well better be able to defend them. And that doesn't just mean like you can give your idea and then be able to punch somebody in the face. That might become necessary, but it doesn't always have to be necessary. The problem is that everything looks like a nail to a hammer. And if that's the only tool that you have available to you, if violence is the only tool you have available to you, it looks like violence is always the answer. And if you're incapable of violence, then it looks like violence is never the answer. The truth of the matter is that violence is sometimes the answer. Wisdom is sometimes the answer. Scholarly approach is sometimes the answer. You know, the, but, but, but wisdom is knowing when it is, when those things are. You know? It's like if you're going to have anything in life that's worth having, if you're going to have a family, if you're going to have a car, or whatever, then anything that you're going to have that's worthwhile is worth defending. And so you need to be able to have both. Have both of these things. The problem is that, especially, I mean, I guess I could, I could rant about today, but by today I mean the, the, the years in which we're living right now, but I'll, I'll resist. But I think that we can all kind of see that this is a case that happens. People have ideas and they're afraid to share them. Why? You know, I mean, I, I can't go a week or two in a class without having someone say, well, the thing is, okay, well, so like, you're not supposed to say, or you can't say this today. Why can't you say it? Well, because then people get all mad. Who cares? What, because then they might complain. <clears throat> I'll ask again after clearing my throat. Who cares? Is it the right thing to say? Or are you, or are you saying what's not true just so that you can get along? So therefore, we lack honor. We lack commitment to our ideas. We lack the courage to express the truth. What's the point in knowing the truth if you, can't, if, if you don't have courage, honor, and commitment? You may as well not even know the truth. At least then you can get away with being ignorant. You know, to be disciplined enough to arrive at that point. Be strong enough to maintain it, even in the face of adversity. To be practical about it as well. To be wise. We should endeavor to be all of these things, not one of these things. You know, it's like I, I don't know, I, just curiosity. How many of you guys know how to change a tire? You know how to change oil on cars? Basic maintenance stuff? You guys know how to install, like, anybody know anything about plumbing, how to fix pipe, like basic, basic stuff underneath your sink and all that? And these are all cool skills to have. And the, what's that? No. Well, not yet. I, mean, I, I wouldn't expect you to. It isn't a, when I was your age, I could. By the way, when I was your age, I could. But this isn't a way of putting anybody down. I understand it. You know, it's like, I think I, yeah. I mean, all I'm saying is that it, it'd be interesting to know these kinds of things, to be able to, To learn how to cut hair. I did a good job, man. Okay. Hear me out. Man. Hear me out. All right, all right. Okay. Give her the camera. Let me see. No, I got to edit it out. I got to edit it out. Um. 
Okay, so if we're on a plane that gets hijacked, <laughs> and you guys all, we, we fight the terrorists, and then your guys are all like, hey, can anyone fly this plane? And I'm like, when I was a little kid, I used to play fight simulators on my computer. You know, like, do the best we got, scale and go. And I get down there, and, I, and we land the plane, and we slam it in, you know, we don't quite land it quite right, but we survive. You know, destroy the entire plane, maybe we've got some broken arms and stuff like that. Are you guys going to walk away and be like, you should learn how to fly scan. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? You're like, oh, first time, dude. <laughs> you know, we, we, most of us survive. That's pretty good for a first time. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> first time, we survived. <laughs> but it was worse yesterday when I, when I got done with it. Um, first off, dude, come on. You gave me the clippers. You gave me an audience. You live streamed me. What do you think was going to happen? <laughs> you live streamed me. You recorded me. Uh, what do you think was going to happen? You know? Should I give him a Would you put a baby in a room with a bear? I said that in his class, right? No. no. Oh, man. So if you put a baby in a room with a bear, what's the bear going to do? Eat the baby. Eat the baby. What if you, well, what if you tell the bear not to? Don't eat the baby. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Do not eat the baby. And you walk out. Is that what you're going to do? Eat the, baby. eat the baby. Whose fault is that? The yeah, the person who put the baby in the room with the bear. The bear is just doing what it does. If you come over here and you go, Oh, this guy, I have a bag of Reese's peanut butter cups. Can I store these here and pick them up after school? I'm going to say, Uh-huh. <laughs> and then you're going to show up after school. And there's going to be wrappers everywhere. I'm going to have a tummy ache. And then you're going to be mad. But whose fault is that? It's your fault. You put the baby in the room with the bear. What's Scanlon is going to do? Scanlon shit. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> you give me clippers. You give me an audience, and you, and you put me on a video. How do you? you know, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> Should do it in the middle. You, oh, and that's it. Okay, there we go. I should get credit for that. I did not just go <laughs> down the middle. Give him, give him a reverse mohawk. As much as your friends are standing around telling me to do it, I did not do it. And I, I was like. <laughs> I was fighting my own hands. I wanted to just go down the middle, but I did not. I did not. <laughs> Wisdom. Honor. <laughs> <laughs> so the state that separates its hairdressers from its warriors. <laughs> Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques.